How is it going everyone? Welcome back to Web Dev Junkie. I'm Cody Seibert and in this video I'm going to be talking about how to use GraphQL, more specifically how to use a library called Express-GraphQL to spin up a GraphQL service. And then I'm also going to use their graphical UI to kind of explain how GraphQL works. And if you're not a subscriber to this channel already, be sure to click that subscribe button and that bell icon because I'm going to have a lot of videos to help you become a web dev developer in the coming months. So let's go ahead and get started. So starting off, let's just go ahead and make a NPM project. So I'm going to do NPM init, I'll do Y. And then I'm also going to install a couple of things. So the first thing I'm going to install is Nodemon. Make changes to a script and then have our service restart as we make those changes. And it kind of speeds up development if you don't already know about it. But after that is done installing, there's two packages that we want to install. The first one is GraphQL. The second one is Express-GraphQL. So let's just go ahead and install those. And while those are installing, let's move over to the Express GraphQL. QL page. So this is the GitHub page for Express GraphQL. And it basically, you can use this to spin up a GraphQL service with Express. I think I forgot to install Express too. Let me install Express. So install Express. And then once you have all that stuff running, we can go ahead and copy this code. One thing I'll mention is that you need GraphQL installed as a subdependency. For some reason, they don't mention that any, anywhere here. So keep that in mind. Maybe it should be intuitive, right? So let's make a new file called index.js. And that's where we're gonna paste that code we just copied. So before we can run this, there actually will be an error because my GraphQL schema is a variable that's not declared anywhere. So we need to move on to yet another documentation page and find out how to actually do this. So if I go to code, I'm on the graphql.org site, and if I click this code tab on the top, I could find some JavaScript code example to help us get started. So to get started, let's just copy and paste these lines here. We don't need this because that's used for something else, which we won't talk about right now. So let's just go ahead and paste that in. It is a little unfortunate they use var. It kind of makes me concerned as to how old this code is. Um, but yeah, we paste that stuff in, and we have a schema, which I'll talk about in just a second, and a root resolver here. But the last thing we need to do is make sure that we use that schema. You notice down here, schema was pointing to something undefined. So we'll use that schema, and then we also need to provide a root value. All right, so all of this, um, let's go ahead and run npm start. Actually, I haven't created a start script. So let me go to my package JSON and go to scripts. I'm gonna make a start script. And just say run nodemon of index.js. So I can run npm start now. That should host my GraphQL service. And we should be able to hit it. So if I click refresh, notice that this loads. It gives you an example of how to do a query. But the important thing is if you click on this right tab over here that says docs, you can start diving into your queries and stuff. So let's actually take a step back and talk about queries. So if you're familiar with the REST APIs, you know typically you have your different endpoints, right? Well, in GraphQL, your idea of endpoints are basically your root query fields, right? So this is like the root object where you can invoke a, a bunch of different methods. So if I dive into that, we have a endpoint called hello, right? There is a endpoint called hello, and when you invoke it, it's going to return you just a string. So what is returned, you can change this to JSON. This could be an object. This could be an array of strings. This could be an integer, you know, a Boolean, etc. And the left can be whatever you want, right? Typically, you can just name it your resource name. So let's say we're doing a blog and you have blog posts and you have users and comments. Well, you might have a field called posts. You might have a field called post. You might have a field called comments and comment or users and user. We'll, we'll cover that in just a second. But just to kind of show you, we have the ability to query on that stuff. So starting off, if you wanted to do a query, you could say query, pass it curly braces, and then dive down into this query definition. And we have the ability to ask for the hello field. And since that just returns a string, that's all we need to type in. So if I click play, notice we get back some data. And inside that data has a property called hello with hello world. 
let's look at the code and actually see how this all kind of links together. So again, inside of this code, we had to build up a schema, right? And the schema is what defines your endpoints and your different data types, etc. But one thing to, uh, to note that's important to know is you have to have a type query. Like if you don't have type query, this just won't work. Like if I save this and try to access it, um, like obviously you can't do anything with that. It says query root type must be provided. So this is important. You must have a type query in your schema. And this is just a, a DSL, like a language they built up for quickly building up a schema. You can use um, JavaScript objects to build up a schema, but this is a, I think a cleaner approach, a quicker approach. Um, so yeah, that is our schema. And then inside the query object, this is where we define all of our fields, right? So you can access different fields on your query object. And it turns out that your query object is your root level object. So we saw it over here in the graphical UI, your root level object is query. And that's just where you define a bunch of different like endpoints or entry points. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, we could change this to whatever you want. So I'm going to say get hello. I can name this get hello if I wanted to. And that might make more sense. So now I can call that endpoint with get hello and click play. And again, we get the exact same thing. We get some data back and we get back um, that string. All right, so now I'll, let's move on to something called the resolver. So inside of your definition of your GraphQL HTTP function, you provided your schema, which you know tells you what your root level fields are and all your different types. But then you also need to tell GraphQL how you can actually like return data back when someone tries to access them. So this is where the resolver comes in. So inside the resolver, we basically just have an object of different properties that match the name that you use for your fields. So all of these map to this. So I could have another one called like, um, you know, we'll, we'll show that in just a second. But again, when this field is trying to be accessed from your query from the front end, it's just going to run this code. And that's very similar to using like a REST uh, API controller, like if you're used to MVC, that could be your controller, this could be your handler, where you do some type of logic to fetch data from a database, and then return it back. And again, this could be whatever you want it. This could be, I don't know, an int, I could say five, change that type to int. And if I save that, the get hello name doesn't really make sense. But notice that we get back a five here. And if we go back into here, I have to refresh it. Make sure you fresh graphical anytime you make schema changes. Notice that we have a different field called hello. <clears throat> all right, so that's all you know, really cool and stuff. But let's look at some real life examples. Let's say you're building a blog, and you want to define comments and posts. So let's just start with a post, right? Typically, a blog post has a a title. So inside of our schema, we could say type of post, and that post is going to have a ID probably. So I'm going to say a int. And I'm going to say it has a title, which is a string. Now that's just the type that we declare, right? We don't actually have a way to access that. So if we go back to our, to our root level query, we can actually add a new endpoint called like, I don't know, git post. And that's going to return the type of post. So if you've used like TypeScript, Typically, you have your function name, and then you have your type definition here. So basically, this is saying we have an endpoint called get post, and it returns you a post object or a post type. And then down here in our root resolver, we could call get post. That's a function that returns an object that has an ID of one and a title. Hello world. Okay, so that's just I'm just doing really simple examples right now, but they're going to get more complex. So now if I refresh my graphical interface, I see that I have the ability to query on two different endpoints. So one thing I'll show you that's really cool is you can do multiple queries at the same time in GraphQL. So I could hit the git hello resolver or uh, root level field. And then I can also hit the git post thing at the same time if I wanted to. Let's see what that's complaining about. Okay, so the issue here that we're getting is because post is an actual object. 
So anytime you're trying to request data from a resolver that returns an object, you need to pass it these curly braces, and then you need to provide it what field you want back. So I'm going to say ID, and I'm going to say title. And again, you can dive into these to figure out what fields are accessible on that post uh, type definition. So now when I run this, notice that from the back end, we get back the get hello results, and we get back the get post results. And this is really powerful because this allows the front end to basically hit one endpoint, so it does one network request, and behind the scenes, the server is going to get all the data and send it back with one response. So that saves a lot of network bandwidth, especially if you're doing something like on mobile where you need to like first get a user and then get the user's posts and get the user's or the post's comments or something like that. So let's just remove some stuff to kind of make this easier. Let's just get rid of hello. I'll run this. And typically the convention I've seen in tutorials is they don't say like get posts. Instead, they just say post. So I'll just name that the post. So now I should be able to run this, change that to post, and we get back our post data. <clears throat> so another really important thing to know is obviously in REST, there's a way to have path parameters, right? Inside the URL, you can pass in like IDs and then your controller can fetch IDs and do different things based on what you passed in. So what we want to be able to do is pass arguments to our like root level fields. So let's say we wanted to get a post using an ID. Well, all we need to do here is inside our post root level field definition, we just pass a parenthesis, we say ID, and that is a type of an int that is required. So again, the exclamation mark means it's required. If I forget to add the argument here, notice that it'll just crash. It'll say post requires an ID. So what we can do at this point is basically just provide an ID here. I'll just say five, or I'll just say one. And when I run this, we get back the post. So how do we actually access that ID inside of a resolver? Let's just try to do that. So inside of a resolver, the data that's coming in as arguments is actually passed in as a the first um, argument here. So I could say ID. And then what we could do here is just use that ID or something, right? Again, this could just be params or args. And then I could say args.id. Um, let's just do that first. So I could show you. So now when I run it, we're just going to get back whatever the argument is that we passed in. Notice that it became five here. <clears throat> so that should be straightforward. But I'm going to do object destruction, I think that's what it's called, or whatever. Okay, so we have an endpoint or a way to get back a post with a particular ID. Now this code example is not the best because we're just hard coding stuff. So let's just go ahead and pull out a constant array called posts. And that has a list of posts with title. So this video is awesome. Let's just make a couple of them. Let's make three of them. So one, two, three, ID one, two, three. This video is great. And then I'll say subscribe now. Because you should probably subscribe. Because why not? And what we could do is refactor this to actually call a function that returns the first index of our posts. So at this point, I should be able to refresh this page. We see that we have a post endpoint that requires an ID and returns a post. So now if I pass in five, we get we should get nothing back. Let's see. Oh, I need to actually use ID here. So we get nothing back, right? Post a null because there is no ID of five. But if we actually provide an ID that exists, we could say one and we get back that post of ID one. So that is pretty cool. And I'm also, I'm also going to use a find method instead of the hard coding because that could probably crash my service. So I'm going to say post. Find a post where the ID of that post is equal to the ID that was passed in as an argument. Awesome. Okay, so that is how you do a single um, endpoint where you can fetch some data by passing in an argument.
So now let's say that there's an endpoint where we want to get back all the posts that are in the system. Well, we could just simply go into our root level field query type and we can add a new endpoint basically called posts. And that is going to return you an array of posts. So notice that this is a special DSL language for defining an array of your posts. You just wrap it in brackets right here. So, you know, just like in, in JavaScript, basically you're defining our TypeScript, you're defining that this posts endpoint returns you an array of these post types. So now since we have that endpoint defined, we need to create a resolver for it. So I'm going to create a function that just returns that posts array. And now if I refresh my graphical and go into my query, notice that we have two fields now. We can query for post and provide an ID to get a single post back or we can provide a post to get all the posts that are in our system back. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And the syntax stays the same. You still want to filter out the different fields of your array. So now when I run this, notice that we get back all of our posts here. So that's pretty awesome. So let's keep on adding on to this. How can we make this more complex? Well, typically a post has comments on it, right? So we need to define a schema or a comment. So I'm going to say type of comment. And inside of this, we could just have a, um, a field called text. And we could maybe say a user is a string, right? So a user could be like Bob or Joe. And then they wrote some, some text. And then inside the post type, we want to kind of add the property of comments. So I'm going to say comments. And that is an array of comment type. So that's great. We've updated our GraphQL schema to accept comments. And then inside the post, we allow it to have an array of comments. So it's very similar to like a MongoDB or JSON object where you just have nested data. So now in all of my posts, I'm going to add a comments array. And inside of that, I'm going to say text is what is up. And then user is Bob. <clears throat> in fact, let me just, we don't need all these comments. I think we've kind of drilled home with how to do an array. So let's just do one post. So now if I wanted to query and get back my comments, let's see, I'm going to go do a post ID of one. Notice that it's still just returning ID and title here. So if we wanted our comments, I could just type in comments here, click run. And what did I do wrong? Comments is an array of comment. It has text and user. Oh, okay. So if you just hover over, it'll tell you. Um, let me refresh because basically it's saying comments is an array of comment types, right? So you have to provide the curly braces here. So I'm going to say user and figure out all the users that posted on this. Or I could say text. <clears throat> So that is how you can return kind of nested data inside of your GraphQL types, right? You have a post that's comprised of comments. So let's take that a step further. Sometimes you want your fields to resolve asynchronously, right? So let's say there's in the database, there's a way to get your comments and there's a way to get your posts, but you don't have a good way to like get them at the same time. So you might need to do two separate queries on your service and then aggregate those results together. So that is what we're going to cover right here. And it's actually pretty easy. All you need to do is define a JavaScript ES6 class for what your post is. And we could say constructor takes in a post. And then we could say object.assign this a post. But the, the main thing is, let's say comments is something that is asynchronously fetched. Well, what we can do is we can declare a function on that post class that just returns some data asynchronously. So we're going to be doing some heavy promise stuff right here. So I'm going to return a new promise. And that is going to resolve some data. And that's going to do a set timeout. And after a second, that's going to resolve some data. So I'm going to say, let's just return post of comments or something. Let's just hard code a comment right now. <clears throat> All right, so comments is going to, after a second, resolve an object that has a comment. 
So what we can do here is now our posts don't have comments really nested on them. And instead, when someone tries to get a post, what we can do is just wrap what we found inside of a post object. And the same down here, we could say map um, post of new post. Now there might be a better way to do this. I, there's probably is a better way to do this. You might not have to do an ES6 class, but this is one way that I found it, or fa found that you can actually do this. So let's go ahead and refresh graphical, and let's try to show that example one more time. So if I wanted to get post of ID one, we can just do this query, right? But if we wanted to get the comments back on that post, notice that when I run this, it takes a second and then it crashed. Hold on. Expected iterable, but found not one or few post comments. <clears throat> What's going on here? <clears throat> um, comments. Okay. I forgot this needs to be an array, right? We're returning an array of comments. So this is really confusing, and the reason this is confusing is because I'm kind of mocking out like a real request. So when I run this, notice that it sleeps for a second, and then it returns you the data. And that was basically just to demonstrate, like, let's say we're using MongoDB or something, and you have the query from a different database here. Well, you could do your MongoDB query here, and then get all your comments, and then return that. So that is how you can do asynchronous fields in GraphQL, and that's really powerful. And again, if we don't actually want the comments, it doesn't make that async call, so it's really performant. But the moment you add comments in, it might take a little bit extra time to actually fetch back those comments. All right, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of like mutations. Or basically, how do you, like we've, we've done a bunch of queries, like getting data back, but how do you put data in? Well, one way you can do that is with something called a mutation. So if we go back to our schema here, we can add a new type called mutate, I believe. I can't remember if it's mutation or mutate. Let's see. Let's go back to the docs. There's no shame in looking stuff up because I don't know everything. And the only reason I'm typing this from memory is because I just recorded an entire hour long video and I realized my microphone was not plugged in. So a lot of this is really fresh in my mind. Mutation. So it says the operation type is either query, mutation, or subscription. So let's call that mutation. And this is basically a, a way to define endpoints that you can like post data into or something that changes your internal system state. So we could just add one called create post here and have that take in a text as a string. Um, and then we could just return a post. So a simple, simple, similar to a REST service, right? When you do a post request to an endpoint, typically you get back the post that was created. So we've added a mutation to create a post. What we want to do, actually that needs to be title. We're creating a post, right? So we need a title, comments, we could just leave blank, ID could be something. So we've added an endpoint called create post. And what we want to do here is add a resolver for that, which takes in a title. And what we could do here is say post.push a new post of title. And then we could just return, actually, let me go up here. Let me make this a little bit cleaner. We could first declare the new post that we're about to add into the system. And then we push it into our post uh, array. And then we return that post here. Now notice that my constructor, I haven't defaulted to like uh, comments should be a default string. Let's say comments or an empty array. And then ID, uh, let ID is equal to four or something. And I'll say post of ID equals to ID plus plus. I'm, again, this is just like hacky code to kind of explain a concept. But you probably be doing a lot of stuff on the database side. But now if I've coded all this correctly, I should be able to click that mutation endpoint and it should add a post. So let's just clear that out and refresh. And now notice our root type, we have one called mutation here. So I can say mutation, we want to call create post, and we want to pass it an argument called title of awesome. And that I think, 
So since this returns an actual, like if I click on this mutation, this returns a post, remember that you need to have the curly braces here and actually specify what you want back. Uh, so ID title. In comments, I just want the, the user back. So if I run this, notice that we get back the post that we created. ID is null though. Let's, um, where did we mess that up? Let ID of four. Ah, uh, this needs to be this. Let me do this. Screwing up my JavaScript. All right, so now when I create a new post, we get an ID of four. I can keep clicking this. We'll get different stuff. And it takes a second because obviously I'm fetching back comments. So I don't want to fetch back comments. I could just do all this, right? So now that we've created all of our stuff, I could just say posts and give me back my ID and my title. There, there you have it. You added a bunch of data to your database and you fetched that all back. And I do want to mention one more thing. You can't do a mutation in a query at the same time. Like it's, you're only allowed to do one, but there's nothing stopping you from putting this endpoint inside your query. So I could just do this if I wanted to. And then if I wanted to get all the, if I wanted to create my posts first and then get my posts like this, you can do that. And notice here, it created my post of ID four and then it returned you all my posts. Except for posts is, looks like it's missing some stuff. Ooh, that's messed up. So there's definitely something going on in my Post is a new post, post up, push a post, return post. Uh. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's like creating all these, um, there's something probably going on with my code that's not correct. But. Actually, why is that happening? No, thank you. Let's see, why would this be happening? So it's my get request. You notice how my get request is changing all of my IDs. That is, I'm probably screwing ID somewhere up here. Uh, next, I'm just going to call this next ID and do that. Maybe that's a better approach. Huh? Well, anyway, there's something going on here. I probably have to look up what is going on with my code. I probably have something off, but anyway, I hope that was a good overview of GraphQL, how to use GraphQL. You know, we talked about how to declare different types, how you can have types depend on other types, how to dynamically resolve fields of types, how to use mutations, and how to use your queries, and how to use the graphical interface. And then te technically, I think if you're using Apollo Link, you can write queries with the same DSL to get back your data. So anything you're learning here is it can be applied to your actual JavaScript implementation where you're fetching data from a GraphQL database. Yeah, so if you have any comments or questions, be sure to put them below. If you like this video and you like this channel and you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe and click that bell icon for more videos like this in the future. Because again, I'm going to be posting a lot of stuff to help you become a better web developer. And also be sure to like the video if you thought it was useful. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you for watching. This is Web Dev Junkie. I'm Cody Seibert. Peace out.